Hello, everybody, and hope you're excited for a session on understanding brewery economic for production profitability. But first, a huge thanks to PK and everyone at Beer 30 by the Fifth Ingredient for all your support here in CPP. Now, let's begin with a quick round of introductions. You know, Carrie, you know, a little spoiler here, you and I were together just a few days ago in New Hampshire. But for everyone who hasn't had the opportunity to meet you face, face to face, what do you do in the world of craft beer? Well, thank you, Andrew. And it was lovely visiting with you last week. Got a lot of uh, a lot of work done. Had some fun. So in the world of craft beer, so I'm a CPA, CFO, numbers guy. Love the numbers. Uh, I spent about 15 years as a CFO for a beer distributor, and I'm currently a CFO and partner for a brewery in Massachusetts. And aside from that, I create financial training and education for those in the craft beer space. So basically, learning how to prepare your budget, your financial plan. Digging in if you got some issues uh, with preparing your financial statements and things of that nature. So I do that. I work one on one with clients as well as I have a number of on demand, uh, a library of courses uh, that people can take as well. It sounds like this conversation was meant for you. Yes, now, it was. PK, because you're next up, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and Beer 30. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. My name is Paul Kadagawal, also go by PK. I am the founder and CEO of The Fifth Ingredient, and we've developed the brewery management software called Beer 30. And for those of you who don't know, Beer 30 does full grain to glass tracking, everything from raw material purchasing, getting into the actual brewing process, lab quality side, sales and distribution, tying that in with cost of goods analysis and feature forecasting, and then accounting integration as well. And the cool thing is, is that you can go a la carte with Beer 30 and pick and choose which modules you need. So designed for small breweries all the way up to the larger ones. So that's my role and that's my company. And Polkit, why is it important for you to be involved in educational sessions like this? I think the biggest aspect is that just based on experiences of trying to just help and pay it forward and getting more breweries caught up to speed. Um, you know, a lot of people are starting up breweries on the lower end. Other people are looking at scaling and the core principles that tie in with profitability and economic analysis all tie in at all stages of your company life cycle. And so the more educational talks like this, the more people have a resource to dive in on later on and ask more questions. And I imagine you've also learned a lot over your journey just through conversations like this and listening to others. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, Craft Beer Professionals has been a great network as well. So thanks, Andrew, for putting this together. And I still remember our very first, you know, virtual conference back in April 2020, just as COVID was starting up. So it's really cool to see things come a long way since then. And it's fun that we're now in person. I appreciate your support on all the endeavors that we've done together. Now, Chris, very excited to have you here today because you are a last minute addition. So appreciate you taking the time for joining this conversation. But it's second nature. I think everything we're talking about today is, you know, what you enjoy talking about every every day, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. And I'm glad I was able to, to join. So I'm Chris Farman, uh, founder of Small Batch Standard. We're a financial agency for craft. Uh, we do outsourced accounting, we do all sorts of tax compliance, and then really the benchmarks is what we're known for, uh, financial benchmarks in the brewing industry. Well, thanks for being here today, Chris. Now we're going to dive into the conversation. And Carrie, this first one is for you. How do you help breweries start breaking down the key components of cost of goods? Well, what I found is, you know, cost of goods sold is probably the most misunderstood and, and seemingly complicated aspect of the financial statements for brewers. Um, people can get their hands around sales. We get it. Expenses, we understand. But that little part in the middle, cost of goods sold, uh, tends to get a little tricky. Um, so really, we just start by thinking about cost of goods sold is basically all the expenses associated with producing and packaging your beer. So it's everything outside of, say, sales and marketing and administration and things like that. So we start by breaking cost of goods sold into its three primary buckets, which is direct material, direct labor, and overhead. And for folks just starting out, I really just advocate that they focus on direct material. So the raw materials, you know, hops and grains that goes in, your packaging materials, cans, bottles, cardboard, and so forth. It really just sort of focus on kind of what you can get your hands around and what makes sense. Um, so when we're doing traditional um, a bill of materials, which is basically all of your cost of goods sold components, kind of want to just start with what's the recipe? Like, what are you putting in this beer? You know, how many pounds of this? How many ounces of that? Um, so we focus on the material side of it. Once folks kind of get their hands around that, start thinking about 
direct labor. So that's again, every bit of labor that's associated with the production and packaging of your beer. So those are the people that are actually, you know, out there brewing the beer, the seller people, production, uh, packaging people and so forth. Overhead tends to be the most complicated and misunderstood. It's like, well, what goes in and what's, what's excluded? Um, so we typically start with just a list. All right, here's, you know, the, the dozen or dozen and a half things that typically will go into this. And then there's all the ways, well, how do I calculate that? Because a lot of it is we're allocating things. So for example, you know, if we think about um, the square footage of the space and you're looking at your lease costs, well, I need to, the lease costs are related to the overhead, the production and packaging of that beer. So I got to get it in there somehow. So we need to do some allocations. And typically we, we would just start with square footage. So if half your space is production and packaging, the other half is say tap room and administrative offices, we'd assign half of that lease cost to your beer. And then we would do some calculations to say, well, how, how do you allocate, you know, a monthly rent into your beer? It's based on, you know, how much you're actually going to produce. Um, so we go through all of those details, but really the starting point is to just kind of get a basic understanding, direct materials, labor, and overhead, and then keep it simple to begin and focus on those materials, your bill of materials, uh, and making sure those are as complete and accurate as possible. So that's that's typically where we start. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Now, PK, a follow up for you on that one. What would be the best practice for tracking losses with COGS? Yeah, so this is very interesting. I think that there's many softwares and spreadsheets that pretty much end up putting losses. So in, throughout the entire brewing process from brewing to filtering to packaging, there's different steps of losses, right? So on the brewing side and fermentation mm -hmm. side, you have yeast dumps that are happening. You have tube dumps that happen. You're basically getting rid of some of that liquid in the process. Some breweries end up filtering. And so at that point, there's a filtration loss associated with it. And then you end up having on the packaging side, maybe you have low fills or you have beer that was in the pipes that you had to dump down as you're kind of getting your line set up. So each of those aspects that ties in together is all bucket is all added in together from a loss perspective. And one of the key things is that instead of taking all of those cogs that are there from the loss side of things, instead of putting them on a different PNL line item where it's basically all lumped in together as just losses. What's really good for better visibility is to actually incorporate the overall finished yield that happened from packaging and dividing that up by all the ingredients that went into it. And so the beauty behind that, and this is one of the things that Beer 30 really does well, is that mm -hmm. you're incorporating the actual losses into the cogs. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about that is that when you start comparing batch to batch, maybe you have your flagship beer and you're looking at batch six or batch seven then the dollar values associated with it, where maybe the seventh batch has an increase in cost of goods, is probably tied in with an increased loss during that process, right? So that's kind of where you're able to start comparing these side by side. And we have a number of customers that get very surprised when up until now, it was just a separate line item in their balance sheet and in their p and and you're looking at literally thousands of dollars that's just there. Now, when you actually start incorporating it on a batch by batch basis, you figure out that your margin on that double IPA that has all these extra hops and a lower filter yield is actually more expensive than you thought when you actually start dividing it out per barrel of finished product. So losses is a huge aspect, I think, as you're looking at cost of goods and profitability of really focusing in on. Now, PK, was this something you always offered as part of Beer 30 or was it something you've added over your journey? Um, just like everything else in the software, it's, it's been added on as we've added on more modules. But from day one, when we got into cost of goods tracking in Beer 30, which was around February 2020, that's when we rolled out cost of goods tracking. It's been incorporated from the beginning. And we've been incorporating all the loss analysis and split batches. And as people do different merges and combinations of being able to track those actual dollar values on a per split or per merge basis. Any quick successes you've heard from your breweries that you interact with about utilizing this feature? Um, yeah, I mean, on the COG side, that visibility, we've had breweries that have increased their overall COGS visibility and thereby their margins by anywhere from 4 to 10%. Um, we're actually doing some case studies with some of these clients. And so it's really cool to think about how that visibility and brand by brand comparison with losses allows you to start optimizing. Um, on the Beer 30 Lab side, we have a brewery, Pelican Brewing out of Oregon, that we're actually doing a case study with them where they were able to get, you know, an increase by about $550,000 in sales revenue just based off of more product 
over the span of a year because he started optimizing for losses and efficiencies. And, you know, that kind of ties in with that as well. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Now, Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the cogs and the tracking of the losses. Sure. Yeah. So I think this is totally timely for, for a lot of my content writing right now, which is around uh, minding the gap, right? And the gap between revenue and profit. I think that uh, brewery owners are, are primarily focused and obsessed with revenue. And there's just so much more that goes into it. The, the, the gap is, is what I'm talking about, right? And there's, there's really two gaps to look at. One is your cost of goods sold. And the other gap is your general and administrative expenses. And for the longest time, I've always talked about ways to increase revenue, ways to increase revenue. Well, as we enter 2023, I'm really flipping that on its head and saying we really need to look at, at, at costs. And, and one thing for, that's really important for me with COGS is just making sure that it tracks with revenue, right? If, if revenue is flatline, COGS should be flatline month over month. If, it, if revenue is increasing, COGS should be increasing. Uh, if, if, if revenue is decreasing, COGS should be decreasing. You know, your best in class breweries can actually increase revenue and slightly flatline cost of goods sold through everything Polkett was talking about, through everything Kerry was talking about, really understanding the, the brewing process, optimizing loss, optimizing your, your purchasing, and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's, it's really critical. When it comes to COGS, we are solely focused on distribution margins, right? Uh, the margins in distribution have not kept up with the pricing in, 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 in distribution or the ex expenses for your raw materials and packaging has not kept up with pricing increases. So it is absolutely critical to be able to get down to that finished goods cost per skew, as Polkett was talking about, uh, understanding what that is uh, netted against losses to really figure out what, what what are we actually making on this on this beer? What, what are our inputs and what's going to be our outputs? So uh, we are we are very very busy right now with with just looking at our our wholesale heavy customers and, and the fact that it is they're relying on a majority of their revenue coming in from lower margin sales and and really understanding what's built into that margin and and where where there can be some some savings is, is what is what is so critical about this cost of goods sold section for me. Awesome. Thanks for sharing all the insight. Now, Carrie, I know you love cost of goods sold and margin tracking. You have to have something else you'd like to add to this. Of course I do. I know we could all talk about this all day, but I think one of the things that uh, I find useful and maybe folks listening or watching later uh, might find useful as well is do like some trend analysis like Chris is saying, if you want to, you really want to correlate your sales and your cost of goods. Um, so for those who are using QuickBooks or others, you know, if you simply like kind of run a, let's say a, a trailing 12 month uh, PL, so by month, dump it into Excel and then do some quick math to see what your trends look like relative to sales, cost of goods and margins. And you can simplify it by just doing a margin percentage, right? So you take your, uh, your margin divided by your sales revenue for each month do some quick math and you'll see what that percentage is. And then you can see how that cha that trend changes or doesn't. Now, very often I'll run this exercise with clients and what will happen is margins really high one month and really low the next and high and low. And then something it's about right. And then it's all over the place. And so it's an indicator that something's up, you know, and it can be any number of things, but it's usually an, uh, an inventory issue. It could be an inventory valuation issue. Um, it's generally a timing issue of some kind, but it's an indicator that something's up. So first and foremost, that type of trend analysis on your margins can indicate, you know, do I have some issues here in my financial reporting? And then the next is, if it's looking pretty good, you know, it's, there's, a, there's not a whole lot of volatil volatility from month to month, then you, you get a good sense as to, you know, am I improving? Is this number going up or down? Um, and, it's, and it's so important, you know, we think about growing revenue and growing sales is is super important however it costs money right we usually have to add people we have to add expenses in order to get that extra sales dollar where whereby if we focus on our cost of goods you know how can we be more efficient in here um that's going to have you know certainly less cost associated with it in some cases no cost so it's really just the analysis of you know what do my margins look like so starting with that trend analysis i think can be a 
a neat way for people to kind of self-diagnose what's going on and ultimately make some improvements. Absolutely. Now, Chris, I want to go back to you on this one. Can you walk us a little bit deeper through ways that breweries can increase profitability as they start looking at the new year? Yeah, sure. So it, it really depends. We, we look at, we look at everything through the lens of where's the revenue coming from. We always follow the dollar. Is it coming from wholesale or is it coming from retail or tap room? And certainly, you know, over the past year, when we talk about tap room, breweries have done an amazing job of placing pricing pressure within their tap room. So a year ago, we were seeing anywhere from eleven hundred to thirteen hundred dollars a barrel uh, in in sold in the tap room. Right now, it's fourteen hundred to two thousand. You know, they, they breweries are very good to adjust pricing and really capture that value when it comes to. Uh, the tap room, and those are going to result in in very high margin dollars, which means there's going to be a lot left over to pay the rest of the expenses. So we estimate your your average profit margin within a tap room, traditional tap room, no kitchen, uh, tap room staff is around eighty percent, or you you keep about eighty cents on every dollar, right? Uh, and now that that eighty cents is is not take home, right? The eighty cents is needs to go to pay. Pay other other expenses and all your 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 labor and other stuff like that. So, really high margin, good good profit in, in the tap room. When it comes to wholesale, look, look, I think the whole industry is experiencing headwinds when it comes to that, and and really understanding what your what your costs are, everything we're talking about now, and and really dialing in that portfolio. I, I believe that uh, a way that distribution can can increase profitability is, is to listen to the market. The market is speaking to every brewery right now and it's 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 propelling some brands and some styles into the next uh, year or two and it's killing off other other styles and brands. So uh, we gotta we gotta stop being romantic about the the, our our portfolio and 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 start looking at where where are our resources going where are our dollars where are our our labor going uh, our advertising dollars going to to support the the wholesale side because where you're keeping about 80 cents on every dollar in the tap room you're lucky to keep about 20 cents on the dollar in in wholesale so you gotta sell a lot of wholesale to keep to pay to the, the rest of those expenses um, yeah, I, th- I think right now it's portfolio focus and wholesale it's sales focus. It's understanding your costs. Um, occupancy is another silent killer in breweries. Occupancy is such a, a drag for, for some breweries right now and really figuring out how to shrink the footprint, give space back, sublease space, really optimize that footprint it is going to be the keys to profitability in the future. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. And Carrie, I know you're also a big fan of goal setting. Is there anything you'd like to add as we get closer and closer to 2023? I love goal setting, Andrew. You and I were talking about this quite a just bit. The other day. <laughs> just the other day. So yes, there's some things that are fresh on my mind. And yeah, it's like you roll into the holiday season, we're getting all excited and whatnot for, you know, getting with friends and family and gifts and drinking a lot of beer, hopefully. But it's also like we're winding down the year. So it's a good time to start thinking about next year and, you know, the goals and objectives that we want to set. So um, the way I think about it is first to kind of set the context. Like you want to know your history, like where do a year end review, right? How did we do this year Um, and do it with some sort of methodology behind it? You know, what I like to do is from a financial perspective, you know, how did we do? What did sales look like? What were margins and what was the bottom line? How does our balance sheet look? You know, are we growing inventory? If if we're, as Chris was mentioning, if we're in distribution and wholesale, you know, how are our receivables looking? Just kind of a quick, a quick tune-up. And then I also like to look at from an 80-20 perspective, you know, the 80 Pareto principle, like uh, what were the things that we did that tended to work better than others? And if you do some analysis on that, whether it's events that you ran, you know, maybe you ran 20 events and three of them were amazing. You know, what what were the characteristics of that? What made it work so well? And how can you do more of that? You know, if you do an 80-20 analysis on your products, for example, you'll likely see that 80% of your sales come from 20% of your product offerings. Well, what can you do to sort of double down on that? So a year in review is kind of a reflection of it's like you got to know your history, right? If you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Um, so you want to go back and kind of do a, a little bit of self-analysis. And then as you're setting your goals. You really want to think about 
some basics. You know, the basics, most basic is write them down, uh, share them with those who can help you achieve the goals. And if there's deadline specific items, which most of them are, you know, get them on the calendar. I typically find if I don't write it down and I don't put it on the calendar, it's not going to happen. So if it's important enough to, to do those things, just follow those simple rules. And then try to wrap it up in some sort of models, like a goal setting model. And the typical ones that we think about are your business plan, your financial plan, some kind of a SWOT analysis. Uh, so financial planning, I mean, this is when everybody's doing it. So we got to create those budgets, got to have your sales plan, got to have your margin plan, your operating expense plan. Um, so we want to kind of lay all that out and get that ready. And if you have specific goals that you're trying to set that are going to cost money, say training your employees, uh, things of this nature. Maybe if you're in distribution, you're going to open up a new market. Uh, we want to quantify, what is that going to cost? So we want to build that into the plan as well. I've seen that happen a lot where there's a lot of discussion about all these great ideas, these goals, all these things we're going to do, but we didn't really sort of quantify it, capture it, put it in the financial plan. It's, can we afford this? You know, what's it going to cost? And, you know, do we have some sort of idea? So really syncing up your business planning with your financial planning so that you've got you know pretty good roadmap there uh, to tackle 2023. So love goal setting. It's good stuff. You no, know, as we talk about goal setting, I would take a break and you guys can take off your CPA accounting, you know, data hats right now. On a personal level, I'd love to hear, you know, what your goals are for the new year. Just, you know, a brief aside of something, you know, you might want to do on a personal level or even for your business. And Carrie, you mentioned, you know, writing them down, staying on top of them, accountability. I would even dare say, you know, once you say it on something like this, it's recorded. It lives forever. You have to do it. So there's your accountability. But for the three of you, what's a goal you have for the new year? Me first. Don't too hard on this one. Yeah, so I, I wanna I wanna climb a, a number. I'll, I'll put a number. I wanna I wanna climb three of the what are there fourteen thousand peak foot peaks in in Colorado? Or is it eleven thousand or fourteen thousand? Fourteeners, yeah, fourteen thousand. Fourteeners, yeah. So I wanna do three of those with with my with my colleague Derek, who's an animal. Oh, that should be fun. That's an yeah. impressive goal. Yeah. PK, how about you? Um, on my end, I want to get back into diving and just keep doing more scuba dives. And so, um, I hadn't thought about putting a goal, Andrew, way to put that on the spot, but <laughs> let's say, let's say in the upcoming calendar year, I'll do anywhere from six to 10 dives. So like averaging one a month, I think is a pretty good. Uh, I'm going to hold you to it. And I expect the pictures on social media to prove it as well. <laughs> there you go. No, Carrie, you know, I asked you this question the other day, but I, I want to hear another goal. What's something, you know, you've got on your agenda you want to achieve in the new year? Well, since we're on the personal goals, I say my goal, you inspired me. I'm going to go to Iceland. Mm. How's that? Because you're like, oh, you got to do this and that. So I was like, so that's on, that's on the goal for that. The other is I'm going to really hone my cornhole skills. So if anybody here is a cornhole player, I love playing. I was watching the other night. You watch it on ESPN. I know that's weird, but that's another goal for me. I really want to hone those skills. Are you going to be on the ESPN championship someday? Yeah, that's, 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 yes. We're going to, we're going to shoot here. We're going to see how far we get. I'll root for Andrew, what's your personal goal going into? Oh, that, that's a great one. So, you know, Polk, I know you and I talk a lot about work-life balance. And so often I find myself in meeting after meeting. And my goal literally is to have, I think, shorter meetings, something you and I have discussed before, but also have more beneficial meetings and accomplish more in less time and try to find more ways I can spend it with my family, take that dedicated time to separate myself. I think a trend for me is always being connected. So I know it's kind of repetitive, but each year I want to be a little less connected while being just as productive. So, so I want to hear more about Iceland. Did, have you, did you visit this year, Andrew? I went about eight, nine, 10 years ago. And Chris, one of the best things about Iceland is once you realize that there's no bears, snakes, or squirrels, you are extremely safe. You could be in the middle of nowhere, no care in the world, and just look at the beautiful sights. It was a truly surreal experience. Have you had a bad run-in with a squirrel? I haven't, but you know, you know, you can never be too weary of those squirrels. I know my dog doesn't like them sometimes. So I think right. if my dog doesn't trust the squirrel, there's something going on there. There you go. Oh, that's so funny. Well, let's get back to your regularly scheduled programming now. So when we're talking goal setting, it's really important to stay organized. And, you know, people sometimes get overwhelmed with the cost it may be to get a brewery software in place to help with these analysis. Pulkit, you know, how would you prove an RRI on software implementation? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
I think a little uh, bit different than Iceland talk, but you know, just <laughs> a little work. different than Iceland talk, uh, for sure. But you can put an ROI on an Iceland trip as well. That could be fun, carry for you to really dive in on the nerdy side of data and <laughs> Iceland and travel. Um, so I think the first thing that I would point out is that, um, you know, when you're building out, when you're actually deciding which software to go with, I mean, pricing on our end, for example, can range as low as 199 US a month, all the way up to a couple thousand dollars, right? And at that point, when people start looking at the market and there's so many other softwares out there right now, really it can become a bit overwhelming to understand really how do you prove an ROI when something is $1,500, $2,000 a month, something like that. And really the way that I think about from an ROI efficiency standpoint is pretty much four categories when you're looking at brewery software uh, implementation. So the first one really comes down to cost of goods sold and how whatever software you're looking at is going to give you the improved visibility and how it's going to help you actually dive in on everything we're talking about when it comes to understanding batch by batch comparison, looking at overall brand histories associated with things and understanding variances and variability. That's really where that element of cost of goods sold becomes a really good aspect of one of the four factors for ROI. The second factor that really comes into this is brew to packaging yield. And so pretty much what that looks like is when we go back to our loss analysis, really understanding what it is that we can do when it comes to comparing batches of beer from a quality perspective. And really what it is that when you start looking at batch seven versus batch eight of the same beer in your flagship beers, understanding really what the overall yield targets are going to be as they get improved upon, right? So if you're a brewery that's, let's say right now doing brew to package yield at 85%, if you start looking at that increase of four or five percent because of the improved visibility or targets or having that real time text or email alert, it becomes really important to be able to then understand, well, I was able to prevent a batch from being dumped down the drain because I caught the knockout gravity that needed to get changed or maybe fermentation is stalling and you need to add in some more yeast or make changes, process changes. And that's really where that brew to package yield and making sure you're taking care of losses becomes super critical. The third aspect that really comes in is time savings from an ROI side. So usually when you start looking at the number of users, and at this point, most of these softwares are unlimited users. Let's say you have anywhere from 5, 10, 15, 20 users, whatever it is. If you take their average hourly rate and then you start looking at the savings that comes from the redundancies of paper logs into spreadsheets or looking at, you know, the end of shift emails being automated, things like that, you start getting an annual payroll savings as well, just based off of the overall time that a brewer or operator can leave from the actual repetitive aspects and focus on something else during that time, right? Like cleaning the brewery, right? If you have time to lean, you have time to clean. If you have aspects like that, the time from a time savings all tie in together. And the fourth aspect that really comes in is, increase in outside sales because of the better visibility that you get with a management system. If you don't have any management system and you're just relying on a bunch of paper logs, to Kerry's point, you're going to have a really difficult time with trend analysis, right? And being able to then understand pretty much what future forecasting is for sales and utilizing that to then feed your material resource planning and your production schedule becomes super critical. And so when you start looking at this, you know, getting the softwares that have zero dollars in onboarding fees like beer 30 for example but then you start breaking it down into one cost of goods sold two brew to package yield three time savings and outside sales all of a sudden those four categories end up becoming a great estimated annual total savings across payroll gross profits yield improvements and cogs so kind of all ties in together from my perspective to getting rois for softwares I love it. Now, PK, you know, a few years ago when you first got in the industry, we saw an overwhelming amount of conversations appear on data. And I feel, you know, we saw data appear, you know, in the technical talks a few years ago. Now it's everything from that to taproom conversations. And data, you know, is such an important thing in our industry. But a term I keep hearing more and more about, and it's not a new word for any of us, is efficiencies. I feel efficiencies is one of those buzzwords we keep hearing more and more about. Can you talk a little bit more about what Beer 30 does to help with those efficiencies? Um, I think the biggest aspect associated with that is providing real-time alerts as things are deviating from those efficiencies. And so one of the aspects that we're getting into um, into Q1 is getting into KPI tracking and getting into better KPI dashboards. And I know Kerry and Chris are going to geek out about KPIs if you start talking about that here in a bit. Um, and so getting into that element of being able to really understand what the long poles in the tent are, right? Like, why is it that 
for example, a logger is taking 28 days to ferment, right? As opposed to maybe 21 or 20 days. And what you can do to increase or decrease the actual changes that are happening from time that's spent in tanks. And I think from an efficiency standpoint, when you start breaking it down, the number of extra days that a beer is sitting in tank, that's pretty much money that you're leaving on the table, right? Because you're not able to get as many churns out of a tank. Or the understanding pretty much what you can do from a brew house side and efficiency side with you know, your grain analysis, getting into better knockout yields, or then pretty much looking at it from the visibility side from packaging and understanding where losses are happening from a packaging perspective, whether it's, you know, somebody that drops an entire box of crowns, for example, and now you're incorporating the cost of crowns or can lids into the entire cost of beer. Or maybe you have beer that goes out of spec. And at that point, you have to dump it when it's just sitting in your cold box, right? So these are all aspects from an efficiency standpoint having that visibility with beer 30, you start understanding exactly where those aspects are that you need to start honing in on and getting your team with better SOPs and aspects in place. So that way they can really understand what it is that Carrie and Chris end up needing to run their analysis as CPAs and accountants to understand just where that revenue and profitability margins really are. And PK, I know you're wondering, I did include crowns in the cost of CBP Connects expenses. They were there. They were on my breakdown. I have them notated. There you go. Awesome. Now, Carrie, this one's for you. You know, what's your advice for owners who aren't brewers by trade and who are trying to optimize for their team on where the inefficiencies are and what levers they can pull in the brewery to impact the economics of overall brands? Mm. Yeah. It's a lot of factor, but I know you got it. Uh, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, I think the first is to, um, if they're not financial by trade, then to try to think about operational ways to measure it, things that make sense. So I used to teach like financial training to truck drivers and salespeople and people that like wanted nothing to do with anything resembling accounting or finance. I hate that stuff. So first is sort of make it approachable. Like, all right, what is it that we're doing every day that then... Uh, finds its way to the financial statements so that you can sort of correlate. Here's what I do. I brew beer to here's what it means in terms of expenses and so forth. So one of the things almost everybody can get their hand around is, you know, sort of payroll expense. Um, so if we think about the two biggest drivers of expense and Chris mentioned occupancy earlier, you know, I've definitely found that it's payroll and it's occupancy expense. And then, then it's kind of death by a thousand cuts after that. You can have, there's certainly taxes are there, insurance and, and you could go on and on and on, but if you really focus on those two things. So I think if you start by saying uh, we're, when we want to measure efficiency or watch out for inefficiency, one of the ways you can do it is correlate your labor to your to your outputs. So a simple labor per barrel calculation can work or payroll as a percentage of sales can work. And in and of itself, that number is not going to mean much. But if you look at it from a trend perspective, you know, what was that? say over the last 12 months, you can run that trend analysis, you know, do it trailing 12 months. What was my labor per barrel? You can do it in dollars or hours, whichever is more approachable, you know, or each month what was my labor per barrel average for January, February, March, and is it going up or down? And where you had good months, you know, what was causing that? You know, a lot of times um, the numbers in and of themselves aren't going to give you the answer. They're going to give you kind of clues like, oh, that's weird. I wonder why it was really good here and here. And then it was terrible in terms of it looks like we got more more uh, inefficiency. So that's one way I would start, just kind of look at your labor correlated to what your output looks like. I think shifting to a more economic model of your products, you know, really it talk, it's really about pricing and correlating your pricing with your cost of goods. So to kind of tie it back to the cost of goods sold discussion earlier, it's good to understand your cost of goods. Like, okay, there's direct labor and blah, 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 all that. But it's like, what does it cost to make my beer generally good what does it cost to make this case of beer exactly and then what am i selling it for and then what am i making on this case of beer exactly so doing this analysis um for your full portfolio ideally but you know start with the stuff that's actually selling um you know take your top selling uh keg product your top selling package product and really understand the costs associated with those and then compare it to what you're pricing now if you're taproom only you know, the margins are going to be great. As Chris said earlier, you know, 80% or thereabouts. If you're just, if you're in wholesale industry, either selling through a wholesale or self-distributing, the margins are going to be quite different. Um, so from an economic standpoint and your, in your portfolio standpoint, 
I think it's super important to run that analysis and get a sense as to what do these things cost? What am I pricing it at? What's my margin? And is that appropriate for me? Is that going to cover my operating expenses? Um, Because as Chris had mentioned earlier, you know, revenue and profit, there's a lot that goes on in between. So we really want to monitor that margin. Like if we're selling more of this product, but our margins stink, you know, that's that's ultimately not going to help our bottom line. So really start with understanding the cost components of everything in your portfolio, particularly the big sellers, compare it to your price and then understand what your margins are in each each of those packages. Great insight, Kerry. Chris? Yeah, I want to jump into this. So I, I read this, I think, in the EOS book, Traction, but it, but the premise is everyone, everyone has a number, right? Everyone has a number. And so for the non-brewery owners or for the non-brewery specific owners out there, they typically have had a successful career doing something else or a passion in entrepreneurship. And so I believe that while the numbers and the financials are critical, I don't know how easy that translates to your your canning line, or your packaging director, or your your lead lead brewer. So sometimes these these metrics or these numbers, because business owners have a have a have a spidey sense on when something is not going right. They have a they have a sixth sense of when something is just not, doesn't feel right. And I think some some goals and some numbers that you can use is is um, simply just placing the number of, of cases you want packaged before 11 a.m. On, on, in chalk on a wall or on the floor. And everyone's going to look at that and be like, well, what's what's four? What's four? Well, four in a case, we need four pallets packaged by 11 a.m. Um, and, and it almost sets some sort of internal competition after a while to get the team all behind this, this four pallets by 11 a.m. And that's speaking to your director of packaging speaking as his, his, his or her exact language. So I think the, the financials are critical. I think distilling them down into the, the, the reader, the user of that number is, is, is even more critical for, for success. So that's, that's my contribution to, to goals for brewery owners. I love that. It really speaks to the importance of an individualized experience and making sure everyone on the team has the skills to be as successful for themselves and the team as possible. Sure. Now, PK, we're going to mix it up for a sec. You know, I know that there are different ways that systems and brewery software systems sync over with QuickBooks Online and Zero. Can you please walk us through the two different schools of thought on each and the pros and cons of each? Yeah, good, uh, great. So um, pretty much the way this is uh, set up is the two schools of thought would be you have some accountants and Chris would love your thoughts on this as well after I finish this up. But you have some accountants, bookkeepers, financial analysts that really focus in on when you're looking at syncing over with an accounting platform of focusing in on the APAR side. So accounts payable, accounts receivable. The cool thing at that point is that you're pretty much syncing over the sources of truth, which at the end of each day are, I owe you money or you owe me money, right? And so at that point, you're pretty much syncing over purchase orders and sales orders. And for the longest time, up until pretty much like three, four months ago, Beer 30 only focused on APAR syncing. And the idea behind that was, well, all of the cost of goods, work in process, et cetera, just lives in beer 30. And you can then do some journal entries every month to then get that squared away, right? And it comes out to be less than 10 journal entries based on raw materials, packaging supplies, things like that. So that's like one aspect associated with it, with just APA or syncing. The other aspect that really ties in is something called general ledger syncing. And it's really critical that as a business owner that you understand the pros and cons of each, because with general ledger syncing, you pretty much are setting up with any system what they're doing when it comes to liabilities, when it comes to understanding the actual cost of goods movement, understanding the actual revenue side and sales side. And pretty much what general ledger syncing means is that from the very beginning, as you actually go through and you go ahead and actually brew with particular ingredients, your 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 grains or hops, et cetera, those numbers are then moving through your balance sheet as they go through step by step. Right. And so there's an element that's really cool about that, where your QuickBooks Online or Zero is being accurately tracked. But the downside of that is, well, if somebody has to go backwards in time and we know that sometimes brewers forget to enter an ingredients or things, it could definitely throw off your overall syncing. And so there's different ways and different ways that the software ends up handling that. And so when you look at it, whether it's Beer 30, whether it's Ecos, whether it's orchestrated and Encompass, whether it's Ollie, like everybody has their own methodology of making this happen. And so really the key behind this is to understand what is it that your business really needs 
And then going down the path of saying, like at this point, we rolled out the general ledger sync for Beer 30 about three months ago because the idea was that some brewers and some accountants really want that line item by line item entry. And so it really comes down to, do you want the thousands of lines of journal entries with the general ledger sync, or do you want to stick with maybe just the 10 journal entries a month and everything else is APAR? And the cool thing about this is regardless of which route you go, you always end up having the purchase orders and sales orders being synced over. So that way, Carrie and Chris both end up getting their numbers that tie in with uh, the revenue side and the cost side associated with it. So just different schools of thought associated with it and really ties in more so with what your accountant is comfortable doing and really do they want the thousands of lines of entries or do they just want the streamlined approach that ties in with, you know, having your brewery software system tracking it instead. Carrie and Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I like to, I mean, it's, it's really, it's a big question. I mean, I think for me, like I like the general ledger to be kind of as simple as possible. So tons and tons of, I'm not a big fan of that, but I can see where, you know, someone might be able to utilize it. So I think if you're ready for all that information, sure, uh, that's great. I, for me, I like to keep the um, summary transactions kind of rolling into QuickBooks or whatever your accounting system is. And if I need all those details, then I would go to Beer 30 or Ecos or whatever the brewery management soft, uh, system is. Um, that's just, I, I think a lot of it is personal preference, but it is helpful to kind of know the pros and cons of, um, you know, kind of how that's going to impact things. So maybe running some test training. Hey, this is what it would look like if you get all the information. Here's what it looks like if just summary level transaction comes through. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's I think it's an important question. And my preference is yeah, keep it keep it summarized in the in the general ledger. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll start by giving you kind of my my background and and our methodology on on software. If if we are approached by a brewery that's doing everything on spreadsheets my spidey sense goes off that things are probably not not being done not done properly and a lot of the pushback is either cost or no buy-in or wh whatever whatever that may be but I, I know at the end of the day without a brewery specific software such as beer 30 the numbers are going to we're, we're going to fail on our part when we're trying to do uh, inventory analysis when we're trying to do our benchmarks when we're trying to do whatever whatever that may be as far as the syncing capabilities, I'm good with I'm good with the with the, the summary coming over. Um, you know, we, we do look at inventory values in QuickBooks and in compared to the brewery management software each month. We do look at cash tied up in inventory. We do look at uh, so that that's that's looking at inventory values by by category, by by item class, whatever whatever the way whatever the way it's called in, in the system, but um, you know, inventory is, is, is a big cash drain. It's, it's one of these, uh, well, we don't, we don't see the loss on our, on our P and L, but we're constantly fighting a, a low bank balance. Well, it, it could be a couple different things. It could be interest. It could be inventory. Most likely it's, it's inventory, right? The amount that's being spent. So I'm good with the, with the summary sync over. I also am in the same methodology as Carrie is, I believe the, um, the accounting software should get the least amount of information just for simplicity and really clogging up that, that sync pipeline. So we do, our, our accounting team does rely very heavily on the brewery management software to go in and make sure that items are being received properly or the, the different reports on inventory and margins are, are being, uh, are, make sense. Um, so yeah, I would say, I would say with, with the sync part, I want to keep it as, as simple as possible. Also to put into context for both of you I, on our end, like about, I think 95% plus of our customers do the APA or syncing and the streamlined approach rather than doing the thousands of lines. There are a handful of breweries that do the thousands of lines and that number is going to grow over time, but that APA are just like you both said, the streamlined approach is huge for us when it comes to mm -hmm. being able to make sure that all three of us, all three parties are able to see like we don't need the thousands of lines that are muddling up our uh, accounting systems. Sure. But you do put it out there just in case they want to. Yeah, exactly. That way, the way, the way that we think about it is you want to make it as flexible as possible. And in theory, you can also shift back and forth. So carry to your point, a brewery could start off and just start off with APAR syncing in beer 30. And then a month later, switch over to GL syncing. And then a month later, switch back if they don't like it. So you can go back and forth as needed as often to make that happen as well, based on you know preferences that are there. 
Well, as promised, we're here to talk about some KPIs, key performance indicators. Carrie, you like numbers, you like metrics. What are your favorite KPIs right now? I'm not going to give you a number. I'm just going to let you spitball for a sec on that one. <laughs> as much as I love them, I'm always so boring when I answer this question because it's like, um, I tend to, I, I skew towards the fundamentals, right? As opposed to, oh my gosh, we could measure this. So the first, the first thing I say is you got the fundamentals. You have to measure your, your sales, your margins, operating expenses, and your profitability. And ideally you'd roll in a cash flow uh, KPI or two as well. So these are always right in front of us. Uh, and usually I like to do them in the context of a financial plan. So if you're saying sales, what's my KPI? I'd like to know what your sales growth is relative to what your expectation was, what your plan was margins, same same are the margins that you're achieving sufficient to give you the profitability that you need what's your margin now what percentage um were you planning on getting and here and, and really this goes for all these kpis to kind of split them out if you're a brewery that has tap room self-distribution wholesale more than one of those you don't want to really kind of split out your financials so that you can understand sales growth in each of those categories margin growth in each or margin what you're achieving in each of those categories and then net profitability. Because we'll see this time and again where your tap room with self distributes who you're making money, but maybe not. And, and you, you do the analysis and generally tap rooms very profitable. Self distribution is either break even or losing money. And a lot of folks don't realize that. So your KPIs to start kind of mirror your income statement, sales, margins, profitability. Um, but really, so once you get beyond that, it's starting to think about kind of measuring what matters because we talk about this a lot where we can measure anything uh, and oftentimes we do. So we're chasing down all, they may not even make a difference. So we want to identify what, if we measure something, what's the point of measuring it so we can improve it. And if we improve it, did we actually achieve an outcome that was, you know, did it make a material difference for our business and whatever that means, you know, making, you know, improving safety you know it certainly doesn't have to be a financial metric but it can be measuring workplace safety uh, it can be overall customer satisfaction in your in your tap room so these are not necessarily financial metrics but they do you know make their way to the to the income statement in some fashion or another so i would start with your income statement start with those three or four uh, kpis and then you can go go bananas after that Awesome. Thanks as always, Carrie, for the insight on the financial side of things and a little bit more. Now, PK, I'd love to hear your favorite KPIs, your thoughts on the process side. Yeah, on the process side, the ones that come to mind immediately are setting a target for your brew team on the number of barrels, hectoliters, liters being produced per batch. I think regardless of the size of brewery you're at, whether it's a 30 barrel uh, system or a five barrel system, three barrel system, Having that as a true target of every batch that we brew has X, you know, X uh, barrel amount is huge. From there, I think getting into the KPI, if you are filtering or if you are transferring beer from the fermentation to the bright tank side, what that metric is associated with it from the filter step and the transfer step to make sure that you understand really what that loss is in between. And then the final one that ties in with the workflow is the final packaging product yield that's there. And so when you start breaking it down, like dashboards, brew filter package is super critical to understand how that's trending week over week for your brewery. And that then gives you, I think, the best insight as to really what's going on from if you have X number of barrels and Y number of dollars that went into the tanks to the uh, uh, final amounts that are being packaged off, understanding how you start optimizing for it. And what you really should be doing is setting that target tight. Chris, I love your example of having that you know, four pallets by 11 a.m. kind of idea associated with it. And the reason for that is because it creates this awesome internal competition between brewers, between packaging people, where it's like, hey, you know, the, the brewer that can get X yields for batches consistently next month, right? And we're going to trend this out, look at this over each of the batches that's there, maybe our core flagship or across all brands, you know, he or she is going to get an extra bonus associated with it, right? Or they're going to get X, Y, Z. And so now you're starting to incentivize your team really broken up by brew metrics, filter metrics, packaging metrics, and the overall brew to package side of things. And you can obviously get into more KPIs about quality, getting into pH, gravities, et cetera, but just focusing from a profitability side, the other big one that comes to mind is tank residency time. How long is your beer sitting in tanks for? Because tanks are the biggest asset that you have when it comes to making money, right? And if you're not optimizing your tank residency and you have beer that's done fermentation on day seven and you're still having it sit in the tank for an additional eight, nine days, 
because hey somebody's not in for canning or maybe you don't have the packaging supplies necessary to package it off you're literally losing hundreds to maybe thousands of dollars a week just based off of not just beer that hasn't been packaged off and sold but also other beer that you could have brewed into the tanks and so tank residency i think is that fourth major kpi that comes to mind after brew filter pack one thing I love so much about this conversation, PK, as you were just speaking, Chris's head is just going up and down, just nodding in agreement with you, which I love. So we're hitting some important KPIs there. Chris, yeah. what are some of the KPIs that resonate with you, especially along the lines of profitability? Yeah, I think around profitability, the, the biggest one for me is earnings, what, what the earnings for your, your, your brewery is. And if you're using uh, QuickBooks or Zero, that's the net operating income line. It's going to be if your chart of accounts are set up properly. It's going to be give you a good idea of what what the brewery is keeping each each month uh, based on sales and cost of goods sold and expenses. I think another one is your cash on hand, right? So we like to see two and a half to three and a half uh, uh, ca cash on hand is what we call it, um, and that that that'll indicate to us that you can pay between two and a half to three and a half months of expenses. The, that's becoming harder and harder these days, right? Cash balances are dwindling, but it's a it's a goal to 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 shoot toward, right? Um, and and back to the earnings, you know, if earnings if earnings are consistently either break even or negative, we have to go to what we can control. So many brewery owners think they can tr control revenue or can track revenue because it's it's very easy. Revenue is at our fingertips. It's on our cell phone. It's in a nightly email, where the hard part is the costs, and the, and and once we and costs are controllable for the most part. So, yeah, that that earnings is is not going to be solved, but the earnings number is not going to be solved by more revenue. It's going to be solved by really understanding the hard part, which are your costs. Awesome. Thank you for all that. And the three of you provided such great insight and such great knowledge today. I'd like to go around one final time and ask you a question. You know, for everyone listening today, what's something that they should do right now after listening to this conversation that's going to help with everything we discussed in this past hour? The, I can go first. The, the first thing that comes to mind immediately is we're wrapping up December and wrapping up the financial year for most breweries in North America and just calendar as a whole for the ones like in Australia, things like that. Set the proper targets for 2023 right after this, right? Like at least start the brainstorming session with your team and come up with, hey, these are the five KPIs that we're going to focus on for Q1. And if you've never done this, it can be very overwhelming. So just ask people, right? Ask your brewer friends, ask any one of us, just reach out and let's just have a quick chat about what are the five key you know, performance indices that you need for your brewery and just set those up now for Q1 of 2023. PK, I know I said one final question, but you said, you know, involve the team. Why is it important to involve the team in this process? Oh, you need everybody's buy-in. No matter what you're doing, I think at a brewery, it, whether it's, you know, you're going to do a brand new release, a special one-off release, you're going to implement brewery software, you're going to try and hit new sales metrics. You need buy-in from your team. And as an owner of a brewery and, you know, CFO for executive team, you want to make sure that people are going to be happy with your decision on it. And if not, like work towards understanding what their pain points are. So if you're, you're not going to be successful in implementing KPIs, if your team isn't bought in on making that happen accordingly. Absolutely. Great. Chris, you're up. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to give two, two recommendations. Uh, one's a shameless plug. I think everyone should go join the small batch standard email list because the content we put out is pretty ungated when it comes to sharing benchmarks and sharing ideas and sharing suggestions regarding the driving the bottom line. So if, if you spend enough time on our website in the insight section, you will be able to find any number you're looking for. I can't even tell you where it is. We have so much, so much content there. And, and the second thing is uh, what I'm finding very effective since I've been traveling a lot this, this uh, spring is, excuse me, this fall is that I, I want to see more brewery owners come together in a, in a round table or mind share capacity. I know that I've been doing small independent talks at, at, in various cities and, and I've, I've learned that the brewery owners that are getting together with other owners on a monthly basis in a group of six or less and really talking about what their, what their issues are and sharing, there's so much collaboration re-emerging. I feel that 2010 to 2015, everyone was really an open book. And then when the competition really started to hit, everyone brought it back to the vest. 
I think now is the time with the headwinds for brewery owners to reunite and begin sharing and collaborating and ideas on on what they're doing as far as best practices, hiring, firing, cash flow, profitability. And you'd be surprised what what what's going on. And it's going to take a, a whole industry effort to, to get comfortable with that that collaboration again. I couldn't agree more. Having those conversations with others is so important. And because PK got a follow up question, Chris, what's one of the cities you have visited recently that's impressed you for whatever reason? It could be the beer, the people, the, the mountains you climbed, whatever. Yeah. So I would say Boulder. Boulder was 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 the most impressive. I, I did a, I did a talk at Sanitas Brewing and it was a, a great group, a very engaged group. And th that's what's really inspired this this. Uh, roundtable talk is because the owner there attends two separate roundtables a month with a with separate group of brewery owners. And you just, you just learn so much. You learn so much and, and there's, there's opportunity to discuss where the successes are, where the challenges are and take it from there. So I would say I, all, all the stops have been good. I don't, I don't even know how many people are going to watch this. All the stops have been amazing, but Boulder sticks out to me. And your city was great too. That's what Chris meant to say. Yeah. No, no, Carrie, your turn. You know, what's something everybody needs to do right now after we hang up in just a moment? Well, this will be no surprise, but it's creating your your budget, right? Doing your financial plan. And I think uh, starting with KPIs is good. It's sort of appetizer, right? Pick a few few KPIs, keep it light lifting, sort of walk your way into the actual financial plan um, and then tackle it. Sales plan, margins, operating expenses, profitability. Uh, if you're already in business, you've been in business, say for a couple of years, you've got some history. Uh, the simplest way to get started, build a little momentum is, you know, take that QuickBooks, run a 12 month uh, income statement, dump it into Excel. If you like Excel, I love it. And then start forward, you know, just kind of roll it forward to next year. And what are the changes you're going to make? You know, what are your expectations for sales growth? Are you going to add anything to your product portfolio that may impact your margins? Uh, looking at your expenses, you know, payroll, occupancy costs, everything. Uh, in between in terms of what changes might you expect into the new year. Uh, and then just get started. And it's, it's not going to get done all at once. Uh, it's not going to get done just by yourself. The team approach, I think, is huge uh, for the reasons uh, both PK and Chris have mentioned. You know, buy-in is critical. Um, so the more people you can involve and do it in a reasonable way, you know, and give them some guidance along the way, uh, the better the outcome is going to be. And you know, ultimately, you're going to get the perspectives from different people. Uh, and then you're and you're going to get their buy-in when you need to execute the plan. So the biggest challenge is I hear when people don't have a budget, it's because oh, it's going to take too long. And once it's done, I'm, it's going to be obsolete and I'm not going to use it anyway. So we try to try to get over that mindset and say, no, this is really a planning session. It's a brainstorming session. And it's also a roadmap that you're going to use uh, into the new year. And I do have, if, you, if you'd be okay with this, Andrew, I can drive a free course on this. So people can take it. It's like an hour, whatever, videos and whatnot, spreadsheets. Uh -huh, uh, that they well, can I was going to ask you a question to let you plug that, but you just plugged sure. it. Now I don't have a question. Okay. Go so ahead. You'll have to drop that in the chat. <laughs> okay. I'll drop it in the chat. So, yeah, because it's like, um, it seems like a really big uh, deal and it doesn't have to be, right? So we can start really small. Uh, we can start, you know, just with the things you already understand. Because people often will say, well, I want to start with my sales plan. And often sales plan is the hardest one. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. But you do know, you know, ultimately what, um, you know, your expenses are going to be. We can control those a little better. Let's say payroll. We know if we're going to, you know, be hiring people or, or having increases and so forth. Um, so there are those things. So, um, yeah. So the chat's not let me do it. So I'll drop it in a little private chat if you want to copy it over. Uh, you can awesome. share that now, Carrie. Your follow-up question: yes. What's something that's inspiring you right now? I mean, you're soaked in numbers all day long. What's something that kind of helps you separate or motivates you to keep going forward? Yeah, it's different things. I think it's talking with different different brewery clients because I always learn something. I try to like, you know, share what I know, but I certainly have my perspective. So I think talking with different people, hearing what their challenges are, hearing how they might have overcome it, best practices, always inspiring to me. Um, because there's so much more to learn. And, you know, Andrew, you and I have talked about this all the time is that, you know, we, we tend to get kind of insular in the brewing space and we talk to our brewing people and our brewing people and that brewing person. And then, but when you go outside of the brewing space, you know, whether it's broader food and beverage restaurant, you name it, uh, there's an awful lot we can learn and sort of and bring into our uh, existing business because it does become a bit of an echo chamber. So it's nice to kind of step outside of that uh, and learn from different people too. 
Absolutely. Absolutely, Carrie. Thank you for that. Now, BK, bring us out. You know, if someone's interested in learning more about Beer 30, you're just connecting with you. How can they do so? Yeah, visit www.thefifthingredient.com, T H E 5 T H ingredient.com. If you just Google as well, Beer 30 by the Fifth Ingredient, it'll come up. Or just find me on Facebook, Craft Group Professionals Group. I'm pretty active on there. Just message that or message Andrew, and he'll get you in touch with me as well. I feel like I should have had it roll across the screen like a 1-800 number, but I'll be sure to leave it in the show notes. So Kerry, PK, Chris, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for always sharing your insight. Have a great holiday season and see you in person real soon. Cheers, Thank everybody. You. Andrew, cheers. Cheers.